Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. When Wild Kingdom aired in the 1960s and 70s, many episodes documented wildlife research efforts. Marlon and Jim accompanied scientists all over the world to observe animals in their natural behaviors. Some of the techniques you'll see in tonight's episodes are no longer necessary by today's standards, but the work is still just as important. Wild Kingdom took viewers to the far corners of the world and cultivated an appreciation for animals and their habitats. Marlon and Jim showed us the importance of preserving the natural world, not just for animals, but for our quality of life. And that's good news for all of us in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, the people who pay. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. My goodness, W.K., you're getting heavy. Why don't you sit right down here with Jim and Stan? Jim Fowler, Stan Brock, and I have just returned from a trip that took us into one of the richest wildlife areas in the world, here in South America, the Carani River region of eastern Venezuela. Here, along a section of the river that cuts through broad savannas and high hills, live a great variety of South American animals. But the Karani has been dammed here. And now much of the wildlife range is at the bottom of man-made Lake Guri, created by the huge Guri Dam. When the dam's floodgates were closed, some 500 square miles of untouched wilderness was covered by the vast lake. High points of land formed islands havens where thousands of wild animals retreated from the rising waters. They might have perished but for the foresight and planning of two men, General Rafael Alfonso, president of Corporacion Venezolana de Guyana, which built the much-needed dam, and Dr. Edgardo Mondalfi, head of the Venezuelan Association for the Protection of Nature. Working together, they found a way to save the animals when the dam was built. Their plan was called Operacion Rescate. That means Operation Rescue. And it was so efficiently carried out that almost 20,000 animals have been saved so far in the largest animal capture operation ever attempted. Hundreds of men, boats, and aircraft search the islands for stranded animals. And the job is not yet over. The final phase of Operation Rescue will begin when the rainy season comes and the lake rises even higher. As it does, present islands will disappear, and new islands will be formed from what is now the mainland, trapping more animals. Then the men, boats and equipment, will move on to the lake once more to complete their rescue work. General Alfonso invited us to test new capture methods for use in this final phase as we took part in a follow-up patrol checking the islands for animals that escaped the first rescue team. We flew to the dam, island after island passing by below, and it wasn't long before our boat was skimming over the quiet waters of man-made Lake Guri. This huge lake still hasn't stabilized, and the water level sometimes changes three feet overnight. That's enough to flood many low islands. There's something moving far ahead of our boat. An animal swimming through an open stretch of water. It's a puma. He's heading for that rock. The rising water must have covered his island and the mainland is too far to swim. He's lucky he found this rock. He looks exhausted. 
He'll either drown or starve unless we can rescue him. I'll need help. We've set up our base camp on a large island where we get a fine view over a good part of the lake. Waiting to meet us is Dr. Pedro Trabal, leader of this expedition. Dr. Trabal is director of the Caracas Zoo and an executive of Operation Rescue. He led the early capture teams onto the lake. And here's one of the first animals they rescued, a kinkajou. The trees this youngster lived in are now underwater. The orphan kinkajou is too young to survive on its own, so Dr. Trabal has made it his mascot. Jim and Stan left camp to scout an area near the puma I sighted. They could reach the big cat quickly from the flooded hilltop they're exploring. Stan reports no sign of life there. It looks like a good time for them to move on and try for the puma. The first rescue teams entered areas like this with caution. Poisonous snakes and spiders were everywhere. Millions of starving wasps fill the air, swarming over their drowned nests. But the wasps are gone now, and we've seen very few animals. Iguana. There are several on the branches ahead. They're good swimmers, and these big lizards are really hard to catch. When we get too close, they escape underwater. The puma should be just beyond these trees. There he is. He looks pretty tired from his swim. He'll be reluctant to leave the security of that rock. Our best chance is to snare him with the noose of our capture stick. Good. That does it. Now Stan can try for the tail. There's no danger to the cat if Jim keeps its head above water. That's got it. Now to lift him aboard. He's exhausted and so are we. Those front paws are deadly and have to be tied before we can transport the cat safely. The rope is made of braided nylon stockings. It doesn't tighten as it dries, and it's soft, so it can't cut the animal. That's it. We've got our puma. His next stop will be our camp compound. Later, he'll get an injection of antibiotic, and then he'll be taken to the mainland and released to roam free once more. We've made our first rescue in the floodwaters of Lake Guri. The puma was safe in our camp compound, and now Dr. Trabal and I search the lake for signs of other animals.
There's something swimming away from our boat. A giant anteater. He's heading for a small island. These odd-looking animals are extremely dangerous. Even pumas and jaguars avoid them. It may be easier to take him on land, and Dr. Trabal tries to force him ashore. Our capture stick could never hold that long, tapered snout. He'd slip right out of the noose. We'll use a net. This could be trouble. Those tremendously muscled forearms and ripping claws may be difficult to avoid in the water. He's attacking. His brain is tiny and his eyesight incredibly poor, but the front claws make up for it. Now's our chance. No good. That does it. We've wrapped the net around him. Now for the boat. The net is far from a satisfactory capture method when it comes to anteaters. It's uncertain at best, and it means working too close to the animal. Dr. Trabal will need another system when phase two of Operation Rescue begins after the rainy season starts. But we've got the anteater, and Manuel, our Creole guide, will soon have us back at the camp compound. Looks like Stan and Jim have seen something, too. This should be a simple rescue, an armadillo. They're quite common. So far, over 3,000 have been caught. It looks like we've been spotted. They're good swimmers but this is too far from the mainland. They're quite harmless with no means of counter-attack. Their only defense is the armor plate on their back. Here's another one, and he's coming this way. I wish all wild animals were this easy to catch. If we hadn't rescued them, the armadillos probably would have died of starvation long before their island was flooded. Grubs and insects they feed on are scarce on this barren island. In the darkness of the sacks, they should calm down quickly. Now for camp and some dry clothes. It looks like one animal has found his own boat, a capuchin monkey on some floating deadwood. We'll bring him along. Capuchins are South America's smartest monkeys and also one of the worst fighters. He doesn't like being rescued. Look out! What a fighter! 
He's going to take on all three of us. those teeth. Ouch! Great cat! You've got to be fast to grab this monkey. Well, it looks like we won't have to abandon ship after all. Capuchins are normally easy to catch in the water, but I have a feeling this fellow is going to give us an argument till the time we release him on the mainland. Manuel's bite isn't serious, and we've got our capuchin. Pound for pound, probably the toughest animal we've met so far. Now we are ready to test a brand new capture system on some animals we had spotted on an island not far from camp. Our preparations are almost complete. It's time to call Jim and Stan and put our plan into action. Jim's kept the boat offshore, waiting for my signal. Now they'll land on the island's far side. We're after peccary, the South American wild pig, and we're testing a new capture technique that Dr. Trabal has high hopes for, the cannon net. One end is anchored by stakes, and the other end is attached to the cannons. Actually, they're steel tubes that hold an explosive charge of gunpowder. When the charge is set off electrically, it exhausts through holes in the base plate, so the whole unit becomes a powerful rocket. Several of these rockets can carry the net over the quarry in a matter of seconds. The charges are set, and Jim and Stan are ready to find the peccaries. One last connection, and now they can begin driving the animals toward us. Once the peccaries are here, we'll have to lure them to the net. So Dr. Trabal baits the trap with corn. Everything is set. All four rockets are loaded and ready. Now to take cover. We just have to stay out of sight and wait. There's what we're after, a collared peccary. When he sees me, he should move toward the net. They're coming into view. We'll have to wait till they're all in position. Good, they've spotted the corn. Hold it! They're all clear of the rockets. It looks good. Fire! It 
It worked perfectly. We caught every one. These are tough animals, and it will take some care pulling them from the net. Those teeth are big and sharp. The capture stick should make the job a little less hazardous. The safest place to take hold of a peccary is by the hind legs. There, now to work it into the sack. This one's too tangled up to use the capture stick. This is the first time I ever wished I had longer arms. He's no lightweight. Peccaries weigh about 50 pounds. Once we get them all in sacks, we can load them onto the boats for the ride home. This is an ideal capture system. The net holds them securely and we can take them one at a time as we're ready for them. Here's the last. We caught every animal. The cannon net should be a valuable tool when Operation Rescue begins its final phase. We know it works on peccaries. If we hadn't been able to catch these animals, they probably would have starved or drowned when their island was flooded. After a short trip, the peccaries will be freed in our camp compound. There, they'll be inoculated and fed before they're taken to the mainland and released. The capture techniques we've tested in catching them may help save thousands more in the rainy season, when the boats of Operation Rescue move out once more onto the rising waters of Lake Guri. What do you think of the cannon net, W.K.? <laughs> I think he was cheering for the peccaries. Well, he ought to be pretty happy if he was, because the peccaries, the anteaters, and the other animals were the ultimate winners in this conflict, as we took them from our base camp to a medical compound where Dr. Trabao inoculated them against disease. Then they were transported to the mainland, where we released them to continue their lives along the shores of Lake Guri. The anteater, like all the animals, seemed to adapt immediately to its new environment. We had proven the worth of several capture systems, but the biggest test was still to come. We were soon to encounter one of the most feared animals in South America, the powerful jaguar. We'll meet this great cat in Operation Rescue Part 2 next week on Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Like what you saw? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for more exclusive content. And visit our website at wildkingdom.com.